now. Hi everyone, this is the second session in our tools module. And um, yeah, so I'm gonna pass it over to Doa, who will be our facilitator for the meeting um, to get us started. Thank you, Arini. Hello, everyone. I am Dua Abdel Qadr, a resident fellow for Nebula Cohort 2. And uh, today our session is uh, about open tools and resources. Uh, you can uh, check our chat to uh, write your name in the uh, notepad in roll call and uh, please write your name, your location and our icebreaker question is about what is your main area of study or research. So please write it down in the notepad. You can find the link in the chat and this call is being recorded and transcripted. So uh, if uh, uh, you turn uh, on your webcam, if you don't mind or off it, uh, if you do. Also, the video will be available on YouTube channel um, and the captions are available via our uh, Zoom uh, caption. Uh, also, we have a code of conduct. Uh, and community participations guidelines, uh, as you know. So uh, we encourage everyone to participate uh, and are committed to our uh, to building uh, a community for all. Be considerate and respectful, and remember that we are a world and wide community. So you might not be communicating in someone else's primary language. Uh, so. Uh, if you uh, experience uh, any uh, unacceptable behavior or have any concerns, please report it by contact as organizers. You will find the email in the notepad too. Also, uh, to report an issue, uh, please email us. Uh, for uh, breakout rooms and participations, if you want uh, to speak, please write S for spoken participation and W for written participation. I'm not sure if we will have breakout rooms with this number of people, but uh, this is the guides for breakout rooms. Uh, and please, if you have any question, please write it down in the notepad or in the chat. Rini, you can start now. Yes, thank you. Um, so today we have Saranjit with us. She will be presenting a talk about metadata documentation repositories and persistent identifiers. And we're happy to have Saranjit here. She was one of the experts that helped NASA develop the materials for the curriculum. So um, I'm gonna pass it over to Saranjit to, to introduce herself and start her presentation. Thanks, Irene, uh, and also thank you, Doha. Let me share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see that. This is still in, uh, it's not yet in presenter mode. Yeah, we can see that. Thanks. All right. Okay. So welcome, everyone, to your Nebula cohort. Uh, my name is Saranjit Garbhogal, and today I'll be presenting uh, and discussing with you about general tools for open science. Uh, mostly we'll be touching on metadata, documentation, repositories, and persistent identifiers. Um, so what we'll be doing is we are going to uh, discuss the importance of all these uh, four uh, tools of open science via four different scenarios. So first we'll discuss what is metadata, then we talk about why is documentation important for open science, uh, what are repositories, why they are useful, and what are some examples of repositories. And then finally, we talk about persistent identifiers. Uh, throughout, uh, like, Whenever uh, we are talking about one particular type of tool, uh, I'll be sharing the activity so that you get a chance to reflect on uh, and think about where did you notice that tool or where you could possibly use that tool. So uh, the 
the first scenario is that imagine you go you're going to a library and uh, you are looking for a book so how would you find that particular book amongst the several books in that library uh, you would you would start by looking for the title the author the subject so you will be using this information essentially to identify that book from a bunch of uh, from a whole lot of books so this 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 is what you did just now by thinking about who is the author, what is the title, what is the subject. So what you did is you tried to uh, think about what is the metadata and then you searched that uh, book using this metadata. So metadata is essentially data about the data. Uh, it, it, it helps to organize or to find or to understand a particular data set. Uh, this will become more clear when I give some more examples. Um, but to begin with, metadata can either be embedded with your data set or it could be as a separate file or a folder or a different structure along with your data set. So now one, um, let's, let's talk about what kind of information is uh, available in a metadata. So a metadata could include how the data was collected and processed, uh, the name of the variables, parameters, and other such uh, general observations about the data set, um, what the variables are, what is their, for example, what is their data type, how are they related to each other, who collected the data, the name of the team that collected the data or the name of the organization that collected the data, how and where this data is, you can find this data possibly, how to cite it. So such kind of information about the data is called as metadata. And why is it useful or why is it essential? So like in the library example, when you know the name of the title, the author, the subject, it was easy for you to find that particular book in a, in a, group, uh, in a bunch of books. In a similar way, uh, if you know uh, the metadata, then you can search the data to which it corresponds to in an archive. And then uh, the other, other uh, advantage is that metadata is generally very easy to share because it's not uh, it's not as large as the original data sets, but still it contains information that uh, you can use to identify where the data is or what the data is about. So now, one of the first kind of data, metadata is descriptive data, metadata, sorry. So a descriptive metadata will have information uh, about things like variable definition, abstract, if it's like a research paper, then the title of the paper, the abstract, the keywords of that paper, um, any limitations on that data set. So in the image, it's the metadata of uh, uh, a, a journal of open source software paper. For example, it's giving information about who are the authors of the paper, their ORCID ID, their names, uh, what are their affiliations, um, what is the title of the paper. So all this is metadata for a particular research paper in JAWS. The other type of metadata is called as structural metadata. So as the name suggests, structural metadata describes the structure of a data. It's easier to understand via this example. So the image shows the structural metadata of a folder in my laptop. So what's what's mentioned there is the name of the files in that folder. So file one, file two, file three. Then when was this file created? When was it modified? What is the size of the file? What is the type or file format, PNG, PDF, and so on. So these kind of, this kind of data is, uh, metadata is called as structural metadata, which gives some information about the structure of the data, file format, dimensions, hierarchy in the data set and so on. The third type of metadata is called as administrative metadata. So uh, it uh, uses uh, information uh, to manage the data. For example, when and how it was created. Um, if a software was used to create that data, then what was the version of the software used uh, when that data was created? Um, 
for example this is a example of uh, the r package splines 2 uh, in this structure or in this uh, metadata we can see the version of the software it depends on R, what kind of packages it, is it importing, when was it published. So these kind of data uh, or uh, yeah, these kind of data are called as administrative metadata. Now, uh, time for a short, small activity. So you might be using some data sets or some softwares uh, as a part of your research or your work or as, as hobby. Uh, try to reflect for a bit what is uh, the metadata in that data set or that software that you have been using. Um, you, you can reflect on uh, either structural metadata, administrative metadata, or uh, the descriptive metadata. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Uh, I don't think we are getting into breakout rooms, Irene. Do we have enough people? I think we can create two breakout rooms and see how that goes. So okay. I'm assigning participants right now. Give me a moment. Yep. Um, I also I'm gonna remind participants if you um, if you change your name to let us know your preference, whether you uh, prefer to write or to speak. We might be uh, having breakout rooms with. Uh, participants who both prefer to prefer to speak and prefer to write, but it's still useful um, just so that your um, fellow kind of group members know how you prefer to participate. So I'm gonna wait for a few moments so people let us know that preference. And in the meantime, I will be creating the breakout rooms. Okay, thank you. Um, so for this exercise, you can uh, literally think of any of the data set that you were using recently or a software that you were using recently, or if not, then maybe uh, you could uh, take a look at any particular directory or folder that you created on your machine and look for what kind of information is available in that uh, directory, like the structure of that directory. Okay, I'm gonna open the breakout rooms for, is five minutes okay, seven minutes? Yeah, five, five should be fine. Okay, five minutes and um, they are open now. Hi everyone, welcome back from the breakout rooms. Uh, since we have a little bit of time, I am curious to hear what you have been discussing. Um, is there anyone that want to share their discussion from the room? Would it so? I was going to suggest, yeah. I don't know if anyone's would rather, would be happy to share, but would rather with the recording off, if that's the case. Also, feel free to share and chat if that's the case, maybe, you don't know. Yeah, and in the meantime, I can read one, some of the notes that I've been sharing um, in the notepad. Um, for example, in breakout room one with GD Edmund and why um, they have been sharing that usually access, they access the metadata from the website from where they download the data set. And uh, the data set contains metadata usually as a text or Excel file. Um, and sometimes it is included right in the web page. So that's interesting that metadata comes in very different formats as well. Yeah, and also it's a perfect example of how metadata can be embedded with the data set. Uh, for example, where GD is saying that um, a portion of the web page within the description, so that's part of it. And then sometimes it can come as a separate file with the data sets that you're downloading. So that's that's a really good example. Yeah. Um, so NJ, um, I'll pass it over to you to continue the presentation. Okay. okay. 
Okay, sharing my screen back. Okay, so after that exercise, let's move on to the second scenario or the second situation. So for example, um, you are working on a research project that involves a lot of programming uh, and you have been writing a lot of code today and then you continue doing this for a month. And then uh, once that project or once that uh, uh, problem, you've solved that problem, you forget about it. And then after six months back, there is some reason uh, for you to revisit that program that you have written and you go back and you open that file and you start scrolling through it. So even if that code or that program you have written yourself, you find it really hard to recall how did you come to a certain task or why did you take a why did you write the code in a certain way or why did you change the step? So this mostly happens when there is a lack of documentation or when you haven't uh, made a good record either online or uh, on your notes about the code or the program that you have been writing or the software that you have been developing. So what comes to rescue is documentation. So you should always remember that as a researcher or as a person who does science, uh, you are your own best collaborator. So, uh, and, and to be your own best collaborator, you should always remember to document uh, the experiments or the research that you have been doing uh, and uh, store them properly. Uh, this also helps you, your own future self. So you're also helping your own future self by documenting your work properly so that if in months uh, you're revisiting your work, uh, you can still walk through it and understand what you were doing months back. Um, the benefits is you can not just it becomes a a a a resource for your for you to refer back, but you can also reuse that work in future, or you may also reference that work in future. So if there are any meticulous details uh, in the process or uh, when you were developing the program or the experiment, you can recall those meticulous details because you had documented it well. So um, it's possible to not just uh, document uh, your uh, research, like normally you would write a research paper, but it's also possible to document your data. For example, you can uh, document a summary of the data in the readme or a user guide. So as an example, um, this is uh, uh, the photovoltaic solar panel energy generation data. Uh, and uh, it shows that what kind of um, data is present. Uh, for example, it says the data set contains voltage, current, power, energy, and so on. And then who collected the data? Um, then uh, how many uh, uh, days of data is included? And then there are some key statistics about the data sets. For example, the data has been collected from 20 substations and 10 domestic premises. It has been collected over 480 days from, from, a, from a date, which is 27 July 2013 to 19th November 2014. Uh, data is collected over 10 minute intervals and so on. So this is kind of a general uh, or a summary of the data set. Um, and it's useful, for example, later on, if if while collecting the data, there was uh, any error recorded, and if that was documented, then later on, when you are using that data or you're referencing to that data, you would know that, okay, there was an error in this data set, and uh, you would be careful whenever you're using that data point. Um, other things that could be answered uh, in documentation of the data is how this data can be used. So you could give some examples of how this data you had used. For example, if you collected and documented it a month ago, then how did you use it? So you could write some documentation around that, where, how and where the data was collected, or if there are any uh, publications associated to that data, if any other research paper referenced that data. So all these kind of information can be documented uh, in a user guide or in a readme file uh, about the data. 
then the other uh, place where you could document is uh, the software itself. Uh, for example, uh, if you open a, uh, a public repository of a software, usually it would be accompanied by a file called as readme file. And uh, what's available in the readme file, usually, uh, this may not be the case always, but mostly uh, these files include how to install that software and how to use that software. So there are instructions on installation and uh, uh, instructions on usage. Uh, if you dig deeper into the software uh, uh, repositories or packages, then you would uh, see that there are also inline comments in the code. Uh, for example, um, uh, if, if, if you're familiar with R programming language, then uh, people often use a hash and then write a comment about what is happening in that particular line of code. Um, what else can be documented is you could also publish the entire software itself. So it, the functions, what are the arguments in the functions, what, what are the outputs, uh, or what is the type of the argument that goes in that function. Uh, so these are the kind of examples of how a software can be um, documented. Uh, finally, uh, it's also a good practice to document the results uh, of the research study. So um, writing research papers uh, is one way, but it's also possible to document uh, or write a paper about the software itself. Um, so, um, and uh, what kind of information can be included in these, in these results is how can this uh, uh, this work or this result be replicated? Uh, what 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 are the packages being used in this research work? Um, what was the research process and so on? So in the example, uh, it shows how uh, to compile reports from R scripts and it, it provides a, a documentation for the same. One of the popular packages in R, uh, which you could use to write such reports or uh, documents is R Markdown. And then uh, you could easily include um, some information about the process itself, and then also some uh, some program, some R code, and results associated with that R code. All right, time for activity two. Um, so uh, try to find a documentation for a data set or a, or, a, or a software that that you have been using. Um, it might be easier to find documentation for the software, but if, if you find documentation for, for data set, then that's, that's a bonus. Irene, uh, perhaps we want to put them back into breakout rooms. Yes, I'm going to pause recording. Okay, thanks Irene. All right, so the third scenario, uh, for example, you are a scientist now working in a chemistry lab and you're building, uh, or you, you're doing a lot of experiments and for that experiment, you do conducting surveys, you're collecting patient demographics, you're uh, collecting some medical records and some tests in the chemical laboratory. So, where do you store all these data that you have collected? So you store these data in repositories or also known as the storage locations. Um, what you could store, you could store the data itself, like the data of the experiment, the results of the experiment, any code or software that you have written, any compiled software that you have written. And the benefit of doing so is that um, after your experiment or even during your experiment, it's easier to share the repositories or links to the repositories. And it's also easier to find and preserve the data or the results of your experiment. Um, so you might want to ask, what are these repositories? What are some examples of repositories where we can store our data results or code or software that we, that we have been compiling or working on? So one of the repositories is called as Zenodo. Um, it's uh, archiving repositories for uh, releases of data, software, or any 
<clears throat> publications as well. So if your experiment or research is generating data, then, um, and uh, again, it's possible that uh, uh, you could have uh, the repositories as private or public. So if you want to share your work openly, uh, you can you can set the repositories to be public, otherwise they can be set as private. So uh, in the example, uh, it's a Zenodo repository of the illustrations from the Turing Way community. So this repository holds different images and illustrations that have been uh, created by the community. Um, and uh, it's one, so if uh, anybody wants to refer to the illustrations, uh, they can, and if uh, they have a link to this repository, then they can go and refer to those illustrations or also download them from there. So it, it's like a, a, a comprehensive archive uh, for, for all kinds of uh, research outputs that you generate or uh, even the data that, you, uh, that that's generated during the process. Another repository is GitHub. Um, GitHub can be used to store your data, results, code, compiled software, and also to watch and control it. So GitHub uh, is also very friendly with Git and uh, you could uh, essentially combine it with Git and uh, watch and control your work. In the example, uh, it shows the GitHub repository of the R dev guide. Um, if you look closer, then there are different files in this repository, which are the different lessons in that dev guide. Um, and uh, there is also information on um, uh, the link to the dev guide. And uh, if uh, if you go to this link, you would find who are the contributors. You can also find uh, uh, the different lessons, the uh, source code or the source files of the different lessons. All right, time for another short activity. Uh, so you might have uh, come across different packages in your research work. So uh, in this activity, uh, you should uh, look up for any Zenodo or GitHub uh, repositories uh, and then take a look at what kind of files or what kind of information is getting stored in that uh, repository. Um, you might, you can start with GitHub. So for example, uh, an easier way would be for if you work in say climate science, then you can type climate science GitHub repository and then take a look at what kind of GitHub repositories you you see uh, on the browser. Okay. The last and interesting part. Now, for example, uh, in the third scenario, we were talk we were saying that you are a scientist working in a chemistry lab and doing some experiment, collecting patient demographics, medical records, surveys. Now, um, in addition to you, for example, that lab has more scientists. There are three, like there are in all three researchers in that lab. Everyone is doing an experiment. Everyone is collecting some information, some demographics, surveys, lab. Uh, some uh, chemistry experiment uh, uh, results and data. So when so many people are doing these uh, experiments and everyone is storing them on, for example, some repositories, everyone is documenting. So people are following all the good practices possible, but then how would uh, the information associated to researcher one be uniquely identified or how would the information that the researchers Two had generated and stored be uniquely identified. So for such things uh, comes uh, in uh, handy is the persistent identifier or PID, uh, which is like a long lasting reference to that resource. Now, as, as we talk more about it, we'll get to know what are persistent identifiers. So persistent identifiers, uh, their main job is to uniquely identify uh, digital uh, records. So all these, for example, Zenodo, GitHub, or 
any other repositories that you're using or software or code that you're building. Um, it is possible to uniquely identify all these uh, digital research outputs. And it's also possible to uh, make them machine readable. So one of the persistent uh, identifiers is the ORCID. Uh, ORCID stands for Open Researcher and Contributor Identifier. So it's, it's a 16 digit numeric code um, in the image. Uh, you can see my ORCID ID. Uh, so it's on the line uh, which is HTTPS, orchid.org, and then after the slash, those 16 digits are my orchid ID. Uh, so now what this would do is this orchid ID would uniquely identify me. Similarly, you could have your own orchid ID. And even if, for example, uh, someone uh, changes their institute or place of work or uh, over years, if you want to see what kind of research or publication an individual has produced, you can always uh, look for their ORCID ID and any of the research or work that was associated with the ORCID ID would be available uh, through that number. So it's like a valid information about an individual. It's free. So anybody can have an account on ORCID uh, and get the 16 digit numeric code. And it's also a good practice to uh, link your work with your ORCID ID so that it's uniquely identified. Um, if you want to try to create, if you don't have an ORCID ID yet, and if you want to create one, then you can go to their website, orchid.org, and then create your own ORCID ID. So now some of the features uh, of uh, ORCID are, it's like similar to how tax ID would identify an individual for tax purpose and ORCID ID would identify a, a individual uh, with their research work. Um, so it's kind of a link between the researcher and the research and research related outputs. Um, and then, um, uh, individual can have a single ORCID ID throughout their career. Like I mentioned earlier, even if they are moving to a different organization, uh, they can still keep a track record of all the research that they have produced and everything can be accessed by their ORCID ID. Um, then, for example, if someone uh, decides to completely change their career or move to a different, so they were working in climate science and they decided to move to bioinformatics, uh, then also the ORCID ID would stay the same. Um, it's also possible, like on many places, I think also on GitHub, now you can link your ORCID ID. I'm not very sure, but I think it's possible. Uh, you could use your ORCID ID on any affiliations, on any grant work, any publications, uh, so that you, know, you can connect all your work together. The other persistent identifier is called as digital object identifier or DOI. So DOI uh, is very useful when you want to cite a, a, a research output or a digital research entity. Uh, it's, it, it's possible to get a DOI, like I was uh, sharing earlier, it's possible to get a DOI for even for things like um, slides or presentations that you make. It's possible to get DOI for data, for software, for journal articles. Uh, it's very uh, so popular. Uh, DOIs are very popular with journal articles, um, but it's also possible to have DOIs for other kind of research outputs. Any kind of media, for example, again, slides, or even if you're writing blog posts or creating any videos or logos, you can associate a DOI with each of these. Uh, DOIs are provided and maintained by the International Organ Organization for Standardization. Uh, and um, if you want to explore a bit more about it, then you can visit doi.org and uh, you will get to learn more about DOIs. Um, some of the features of DOIs are that um, they are static pointers to any of the document on the internet. So any digital uh, work which is present on the internet, um, a, a DOI will uniquely point to a particular version of it. Um, and each new version of that data software or any document uh, that you produce will require a 
new DOI. Um, sometimes some DOI providers would say that they can give one DOI for all the versions and all the releases of a specific software or data set. Uh, and uh, so it depends uh, what, what the purpose is. Um, if, for example, uh, the advantage would be, for example, if you look for the DOI of a certain research paper, uh, and you uh, there is a research paper does have a DOI, then uh, in the long run, whoever uh, searches for that DOI will uh, be able to find that particular research paper. So even if uh, a website or uh, the publishing website, which was hosting that research paper, changes a lot of things in its website. Even then, your research paper would be safe if it had a DOI and that DOI was uniquely linking to your research paper. So it it's it becomes really easy to find research products if they have a, a DOI associated with them. So in this case, uh, the... Uh, this is a website for Earth Data ASDC. Uh, now we are going to learn about what is resolving a DOI in, uh, in a bit. But um, for example, even if everything else changes on this website, but uh, because this uh, data set has a DOI associated with it, um, which is 10.5067 and the rest of it, it will always be uh, uniquely identified. So whenever this, this link, somebody searches this link, they'll be able to access this data set and also download it. So here are some examples of how persistent identifiers are used uh, in day-to-day -day research work. For example, if a researcher is writing some code, they upload their code to a repository, then they get a DOI for that code, and then others can review and use the code and also cite it. So there are advantages of having a DOI, there are advantages of hosting things on repositories because people can also cite your research even if, if it, even the code is citable. So that is the advantage. Um, the other example is, uh, for example, a workshop planning committee uh, authors uh, a paper with the results, which has the results of the workshop. So it's a summary paper of whatever happened at the workshop. So there are there are multiple people writing the summary paper. So what they will do is they will um, collect the orchids of everyone who was involved in the workshop uh, and they can include that in the paper. So if uh, then they decide to publish this paper in a journal, uh, the paper would also get a DOI and then everything is uniquely linked. The third example is about a community scientist who is attending an online conference talk and um, what they do is they uh, store all these all the uh, their slides in a online repository, say uh, Zenodo and then associate a DOI with uh, with that repository so um, if they want to share their slides with their colleagues or the audience uh, of their uh, talk they can simply share that link and then the audience would be able to view their slides uniquely the last activity uh, and a very interesting one uh, what you need to do is to find and resolve a doi so resolve uh, it's uh, given here uh, how you would be able to resolve a DOI. Um, by resolving means you will be taken to the information of that product. So if you give a particular DOI number to this website, doi.org, uh, and ask it to resolve the DOI name, then it will. what it will do is it will take you to that um, unique product, which is associated with the DOI. So <coughs> in this example, uh, either you can uh, search a software or a data set which has a DOI and try to resolve that DOI or if you don't have, uh, if, if you can't think of a software or data set, then you can um, locate the uh, DOI listed on this link 
I think this exercise is also available on the on the notepad on the etherpad so you can take that link from there and then copy that link go to www.doi.org and scroll to the bottom of that page where you should see something like try to resolve a DOI name paste the link that you have copied and then click on the resolve button click submit and then you should be able to see a page that it's getting redirected to so this is called as resolving a doi uh, i would i would suggest that you try this activity uh, uh, to get to know how you can resolve a doi uh Irene, uh we might want to send them to breakout rooms to try this activity Yeah, uh, we can do that. Um, so I'm going to pause the recording now. Mm -hmm. My screen. Okay, so in the last activity where we are trying to resolve a DOI, uh, line 139, uh, so either you could uh, do this uh, with a DOI that you know uh, for a software or a data set, but if not, if you want to try out how this works, then I have shared a link on line 142. Um, so what you have, what you need to do is click on this link. Uh, then it opens this page uh, about our data ASDC uh, and there is some data set here. If you scroll down a bit, you would see this section, which is called as DOI. What you need to do is copy this link that is there. Uh, go back to the frame of pad. I think I have been incorrectly saying etherpad, but yeah, go back to the frame pad on line 143, open um, the link to doi.org, scroll all the way down till you see something like try resolving a DOI name, then copy the DOI that you have just, uh, sorry, paste the DOI that you have just copied. And then once you click on submit, this is called as resolving a DOI name, but what it will do is it will take you to the uh, to the um, a research product that is associated with this DOI uh, and that is available on the internet. So if I click submit, essentially it should take me back to that link from where I had copied the DOI from. So let's see if that happens. I'm clicking on submit. And yes, it takes me back to that same page. So this means that this DOI is uniquely linked to, to this uh, information on the internet. So this is called as resolving a DOI. I think that was it from my side. Uh, if there are any questions, happy to answer now, or maybe if you want to write down your questions, then I can, uh, get back to you via the frame of pad. I think we have uh, just a couple of minutes to uh, end our session for today. So uh, thank you, Serenji. If you have any question, please write it in the chat or in the notepad. So uh, we uh, we are about to end our session for today. Uh, see you next week uh, in the data module. Uh, you will uh, have uh, our uh, uh, cohort call on Tuesday, 5th of November, intro to open data and fair principles. And uh, there's a homework reminder, fill out a template to join coaching sessions. We will share the link to sign up next week. Thank you, Saranjit. Thank you, Arini and you. See you next week. Thank you for joining. Thanks all. It was a nice intimate crowd today. Mm -hmm.